Kathy. Now, in the approach to asset allocation, many investment professionals have applied the Markowitz approach that's to determining the optimal mix of stocks, bonds and cash. But how does this weigh up in the current environment? And is fixed income still a relevant asset class? To answer the question, Warren caught up with Citadel's Martin Ackerman for more. Martin, thanks for joining us. Obviously, we've got this, uh, we've all been raised on this financial literature. We, we try and find this efficient frontier that Markowitz came up with. Just for the benefit of our viewers, just take us through what that meant and then we can talk about how that's perhaps changed in the current environment. Yeah, I think um, Markowitz, basically the theory that he suggested many, many years ago, it's still relevant today, although there's, there's a lot of critique against that. But I do think that for us, it's a tool. Uh, we do look at it from time to time, but it's not the holy grail. Um, and what he's basically saying is that if you look at a, a range of asset classes, then by combining those asset classes, you can actually improve the risk return combination of that portfolio. So you can move the whole efficient frontier to the upside, so getting higher return at lower risk. So it's still uh, applicable today. Uh, I do think the problem or the critique against that is to say, but to run something like that, you need some idea in terms of what is the potential return from those asset classes and what is the potential risk. And that's a real flaw because as we went through the financial crisis, a lot of the models that people use to try and get an idea in terms of potential return and risk didn't work. So the model, the Markovich model works perfectly as long as you get your forecast right. And I think that's a challenge. So what we are doing is we are looking at different ways to try and determine the potential return from asset classes. It's not really a forecast. Once we've done that, we will still look at Markovich and try and build an efficient frontier to get an idea in terms of where we are today currently what is the most optimal portfolio given a certain mandate or risk profile or objective that a client wants to achieve over time. You're running the offshore portfolios uh, for Citadel and, and, and Citadel clients. Obviously, you have to make decisions around asset allocation in that environment. We all know this, the scenario you face there with these, these bond yields that are very low. Mm. What, what do you do? I mean, we, we, we're having al almost getting to, to the point where fixed income is becoming a non-asset class because it's just not generating any real returns. So how have you been substituting uh, the role that fixed income used to play in a, in a Markowitz type model with your clients' portfolios? Yeah, I think that's, that's a good question. You know, we're in a situation where, as you know, you know we've got negative real rates on, on most of the, the bonds around the world in, in the West. Um, so for us, it's very difficult to say for a client, you know, let's invest in these kind of assets and immediately you, you're not going to keep up with inflation. Plus, you're running a massive risk that when those rates start to normalize as the economic recovery continues, you'll make a capital loss. And we're not talking about rates normalizing back to the old 5%. You know, we're talking about just going from 1.7 where we are currently to maybe 2, 2.5 and, and you already make a capital, capital uh, loss. So we need to be clever about that. So again, it very much depends on what you want to uh, achieve with the portfolio, what the objective uh, of that specific portfolio is. Um, so just a few things on that. So in terms of alternatives, we need to look at alternatives. Uh, one alternative is to go up the risk spectrum, so to go more into equity. The nice thing about equity at this point in time is despite the negative concern of out there in terms of the sustainability of earnings, if we look at those companies, you know, most of them got a lot of cash on their balance sheet. Um, at the moment, given the concern in the world, you buy them below fair value, so you still buy them at a, at a reasonable discount. And you know, we're in a world where we muddle through, but if you look at the IMF forecast, they say global growth can be around about 3%. In that kind of environment, companies can still generate good profit. So you buy a good profit stream, they're paying handsome dividends. In most cases, you know, it's, it's double what you get from a government, but it is more risky because we know equity markets can jump up and down and if, if there's another scare or, or fear out there, whether it's Europe or China cooling down, we know markets react that way. So if it's a longer term investor and there is a need for income, then we definitely look at going into higher dividend paying companies. You get that yield. Obviously, there's some volatility, but there's also the certainty that those companies are healthy. They've deleveraged since the crisis started and they can pay that. If you need to play in, call it the fixed income space, then typically what we do is we say, okay, well, let's go and look at a few things. First of all, underweight bonds. That's, that's uh, the best way of doing it in this kind of environment because we do expect that rates will normalize, maybe not this year, because there's still massive support from, from most governments in the West in terms of quantitative easing. But when that normalization starts to play out, there is a risk. So we tend to, to be quite underweight the asset class in general. And then when we're in the asset class, we tend to go short duration. 
So just try to make the portfolio less sensitive to those changes in interest rates. And then also on top of that, you can play a little bit in the spread space. What I mean with that is you can look for alternative high yield opportunities, whether that's corporate bonds, uh, investment grade, uh, emerging market bonds, high yield bonds. Um, those are also getting quite expensive. I think it's Monday when high yield bonds in general, uh, for the first time, went under 5% nominal yields. Um, so, so you're seeing you're seeing the rush of money, uh, oh you know, yes, with definitely. with people all facing the same problems as you are. You're seeing the rush of money into some of these asset classes, which is distorting the risk return, uh, the pricing of risk in, in some of those markets. Yes, yeah, I do think that. Um, I personally think that 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 the government bonds is no longer the risk free rate. You know, there, there's a lot of risk in in buying in those. And if you think about high yield bonds, the market is pricing it as if there's no risk. You know, it, it's as five percent. Uh, that's the same as the U.S. Treasury bond a few years ago, but it's a high yield bond, which is uh, typically a junk company in, in the United States or somewhere else in the world. So the market or the money is definitely flooding there, but it's also part of the whole quantitative easing um, target that the central banks are trying to achieve, because what they are doing is by pushing down the government bond yields to the levels we're seeing currently. They're getting it right to keep those below typical global inflation. So we've got the negative real rates. So they deflate the debt levels. That's what we're trying to achieve. While they're doing that, there's an incentive for investors to say, but we don't want to be here. We need to look for alternatives. So the money is flooding into the higher alternatives, like I've mentioned, the emerging market bonds and, and the high yield bonds. So we've seen some big inflows into, into that space. But as a result of that, it also started to, to become quite over, overvalued and quite expensive. So in our mind, if you simply forget about risk, and when I say risk, it's the typical volatility of the asset class. If you just purely look at valuations, then equity is probably the best place to be for the longer term. That's where you're likely to get the most secure longer term potential return from. Um, then if you look at anything in the fixed income space, it is quite, quite expensive. But having said that, while we in this environment of negative real rates with the full commitment from central banks, you know, we're likely to still get some value out of that space. And that's why in our fixed income environment, if we need to go there, like I've mentioned, we underweight the, ac uh, the, the asset class, we go short duration and we add a little bit of spread, which is what we spoke about now to give that pickup. But there will be a time probably not going to be this year, but it's very much in line with the Fed's kind of target to say, when do we see uh, unemployment in the US getting down to 6.5%, where rates will start to normalize. And then the trick will be for global investors to move out of that asset class before the masses is coming uh, um, and to get out. And there is a mass coming because we talk about this great rotation and yes. how many uh, foreign investors are sitting on the sidelines still in fixed interest. Uh, uh, almost scarred from the global financial crisis. Uh, that will be a, a, a wall of money uh, and that I, s I suggest would probably support uh, equity prices going forward. Initially, definitely. If, if we look at that, um, there's been a massive inflow in fixed income funds um, over the past two or three years. Uh, we've seen a little bit of a change since the start of this year where we've seen money dripping back into equities very early days. Uh, we need the big guns, you know, the institutional investors, the, the pension funds in the world to to feel more confident in the fact that the global recovery will be sustainable and also to again believe in equity markets giving a proper return. That's not really there yet. Um, what we're seeing at the moment is a lot of retail investors doing that, so we need to see the big institutional money move. You're right to say that when that happens, um, that will be a massive support initially. You get that wall of money flowing in, so the momentum support for equity markets pushing up prices. Uh, and if we think ahead, you know, at the moment, like I've mentioned, most of those equities are still trading at discount. If that starts to happen, the money flows in, that discount will start to close. Uh, the equity market is likely to re-rate. Um, and now probably with a, a three-year view in mind, that will be a point where we as global investment managers need to sit down and say, so what do we do in terms of changing the portfolio and not being overweight risk anymore? One last question before we go. Uh, listed property, is that a still a viable substitute for, for investors looking for yield? Yeah, listed property at this point in time is pretty much part of that space where investors are going for, for yield hunting. Uh, so whether you look at South Africa or uh, at the listed space abroad, uh, property abroad, they offer you something better than government bonds. So we do see that the market or the investors are flooding into that space as well. It is uh, visible in terms of returns here to date. Uh, most property indices are doing well. What we are saying is, well, if you look at that, um, I've already mentioned what you do feel that equity is offering you a better yield, uh, earnings yield, a better potential return and a bigger discount. 
So, you know, if I don't need to bring in the property space, I would rather take that risk and also up that into equity and overweight equity more instead of having a 10 or a 15% allocation to property.